Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Hopefully this is all working okay. We're doing some new things today, a number of new things actually. And so uh, things could get a little crazy here, but we're going to experiment and appreciate your <laughs> patience and feedback. Just want to check how are, is the audio? Is it coming across okay? Just want to make sure that uh, everyone can hear us all right and that things sound all right. So if you could give us a little note here in the chat, that'd be awesome. Okay. Uh, let's jump over to the agenda for today. We have got uh, a number of things coming up. First of all, biggest question I have received in the last three weeks is how do I send in my questions for these sessions ahead of time? So here's the way it works. If uh, th this, is, this whole session was set up to be a help session for those who have signed up for the courses, of course, anyone is welcome to join. But if you want to submit your question ahead of time, you do need to be signed up at the school and you need to opt in to the emails. Now, I learned some things about how that was working. I thought it was checked by default, but it turns out it was unchecked by default. So a whole bunch of people that signed up ever since the European personal information laws went into effect, was that a year and a half ago? Somewhere in that range? All of you did not opt in unless you specifically put a check mark in that box. So if you do want to get the email saying, hey, our session's coming up, it's at this time, reply to me here with your questions to submit them, then you just need to go into your school account at school.learnlightandsound.com into your profile and you can opt into those emails. Um, all right, um, and those, and I've changed the language on the sign up now. So for anyone new that signs up, it should be a lot more obvious what you're doing there. It's still unchecked, but it's very clear. Hey, if you want to get the emails to it, you know, with the announcements for the sound for video sessions, click here. Um, before it just said, uh, I think it said opt in to marketing emails, which was very confusing. And I didn't even realize until recently that wasn't even an option to change the text on that through the platform I'm using. So in any case, that is uh, doing okay. All right, uh, next up, uh, we've had a number of questions about the Zoom F6 course. That's still on track for release on June 1st. Of course, we have all our other courses as well, the Mixed Pre-Course, uh, Zoom F8, F8N, Zoom F4. We have a more general production sound course that um, of course uh, covers all kind of the, the basics of sound for film and video. And then we also have one for post-processing in Adobe Audition. And that one's very specific about processing uh, individual dialogue tracks. So hopefully, if, if that's something of interest to you, we have that as well. And then we have a Fairlight Fundamentals class. That'll be the next one to be updated because it was originally made with version 15. So updates coming on that one. All right, um, Rode <laughs> sent a whole bunch of new stuff over. So we looked at this one a couple of weeks ago. This is the Wireless Go the in white. But they also sent over the Lavalier Go, which I have not tested yet. So this is an inexpensive, well, relatively inexpensive Lavalier. I think it's about $70, if I'm not mistaken. We might even take a listen to that today if we have time. They've got a little mag clip here. So if you want to attach your um, transmitter, to something mag uh, metal, you could do that. I think that's what that's for. Oh, it's to it's to make it easier to put it on the talent with a magnet as opposed to the clip. And this actually is one of the more interesting ones to me. This is the, um, actually, I guess I could use the overhead camera. Um, this is called the Interview Go. And the idea here is that you clip on the wireless Go under here, you put a little foamy on top, and then you have basically a stick interview mic. Um, so that's what it looks like there. And in theory and use, that's what it looks like. So <laughs> uh, we'll take a little bit of a closer look at those in just a minute here. And then we have a variety of microphones here. I don't know if you can see them all. So I'm speaking, what you're hearing right now is the Rode NT1, um, which I actually quite like. Pretty good microphone, especially for its price. We have the Shure SM7B, a Lewitt LCT Pure 440, large diaphragm condenser here. And then we also have uh, this one here, which is the Texone Audio Stellar X2 Vintage. And so we'll take a listen to each of those here in the next little bit. What I'm curious about is I'm getting ready. I'm still, I know it's been a while, but I'm still working on uh, putting together a um, kind of an overview, like a meta review of a bunch of microphones that would plausibly be used for voiceover work. 
So that's why we're looking at those. Now the Shure SM7B, not, not necessarily. That'd be more for live streaming in my opinion generally. Could you use it for voiceover? Not very many people do. I think for voiceover, typically you're looking for a large diaphragm condenser sound. But um, we're going to throw that in the mix just as a, I guess, kind of a point of contrast, if you will. So that'll come up. And then we have a question and answer session. We got a lot of good questions again this week. So let's go ahead and dive in and let's look at these Rode Wireless Go accessories here. So I'm actually going to pull this microphone out first. That is one we've gotten lots and lots of questions about. So let's just yank this one out and we probably will, let's put this up against some of the uh, microphones here. So they've done a good job of, we're not really an unboxing channel and I, I don't really like unboxings, but I didn't have time to get into these beforehand. Wow. Uh, I guess A plus to Rode for making boxes that are difficult to get into. <laughs> All right, get rid of that. Okay. Strangulation hazard, so keep it away from small children. What else is in here? And then a little desiccant pack there, a little case that it comes with. Let's go ahead and open this guy up. So the idea with the white, of course, it makes it a little easier when you're doing corporate work or maybe weddings where you're working with talent that have white clothing, whether a white shirt or a wedding dress or what have you. This looks a lot like the Smart Love Plus. Get this off of here. Mmm. Cable wrapping. Okay, there we go. All right, we'll get this plugged in and we'll get a listen to that as well in just a little bit, just to see how that sounds. We'll probably just take that directly into the Mix Pre, which is what we're using again today. Little mag clip. Let's see what this one's about. I think the idea here is just to make it. If you don't have a lapel or something like that to connect the transmitter onto somebody, now you have a little magnet option. Hmm, it's a pretty good strong magnet. So, presumably the way this works, whoa, hey, yeah. <laughs> Let's pull out, here's my original kit here. Okay, we have the transmitter here. So I assume that this goes on. Okay, that clips on like that. Makes sense. And then this will go behind the clothing to hold it in place. Yeah, that should do the job. It's a pretty strong magnet. Look at that. If I pull it up just by the magnet it overcomes the spring. Good, okay, so there's another little addition. They've done a lot. I guess this, um, I'm gonna guess that for Rode, the wireless Go system is selling pretty well. And so I've had a lot of requests for various types of accessories and they're filling out the product line, if you will. Okay, let's take a look at the interview Go. Oh, uh, we're going to need a knife for this one. Thanks for hanging in there with me on this one, people. Oops, not scissors. Knife. There we go. Okay. Pop this out and see what we've got. Okay, there we go. So this is plastic here. Wasn't sure what to expect on that front. Yeah, I guess I probably would have guessed plastic. All right, then here is our transmitter. And that just sort of slides in like that. That goes over like that. <laughs> Lots of foam, that's probably good because if you're working outside doing interviews, that's gonna be good. And then of course it will look, well, it'll maintain the wireless look. So it's a pretty, it feels like a solid piece of plastic and by solid, I mean literally, it's not the. It's not just hollow. 
there's at least some reinforcement throughout the shaft there. So there it is, the interview go. So we'll give that a try in a little bit more detail. So cool. Okay, so let's get over to our microphones and start sampling microphones here. Switch back over to the main cam here. Just taking a look here, see if we have any comments that we need to take care of, if there's anything funky or broken. <laughs> okay. All right, some funny comments. Very good. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and switch through the microphone. So again, right now you're hearing the Rode NT1. That's this guy right here. And um, probably, what, six inches away, I would say. And then what I'm going to do here is we can switch over. So let's go to the Shure SM7B. I'm going to use that as the, the ear palate cleanser, if you will. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a fair way to, call it, to put it for the Shure SM7B. But here's this. Actually, before we do this, what I do need to do is turn off some processing. So I'm doing some processing... Ah, I have a number of explanations to make. So we need to talk about our chain here, our video and signal chain, our audio and video signal chains. So we're using the same setup in terms of um, microphone uh, mix pre into Canon C200, and that's coming out to the A10 Mini Pro this time. And rather than uh, using Ecamm, we're not using Ecamm today, we're streaming directly from the A10 Mini Pro to YouTube using its inbuilt encoder. So I'm curious what the video quality is looking like. Um, we have it set to 12 megabit in terms of its uh, encoder, the, the stream. So let's see what we're at. We're actually streaming in real time. It looks like we're closer to nine megabits per second. And it's saying that the cache is okay. So I'm curious at how this compares to what you typically see on the live streams. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing, we out, we do have some audio processing turned on. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off here. So we're gonna turn off our EQ and I'm gonna turn off. All right, we've turned everything off in terms of dynamics processing. So it's probably gotten a lot quieter. Okay, now is a good time to talk about microphones and actually do samples. All right, the video's looking good. Okay, very good. So again, here we're listening, first of all, to the Shure S, uh, sorry, the, no, we're not listening to the Shure. We're listening to the Rode NT1, large diaphragm condenser microphone, comes in at about $270 US. It comes with this Rycote shock mount, which is actually pretty nice, I thought. And it comes with this double layer um, metal pop shield. And so that's what you're hearing right now. Now, I think this one works pretty well, my voice. I. The sibilance is definitely present. There's some mouth noise as well, especially if you get up really, really close. But um, overall, it's a pretty, it's not a bad sound. I'm not, I don't hate it. <laughs> Let's say that. So I'm going to go ahead and mute this one, and we're going to switch over to the Shure SM7B. Okay, there we go. Now we should be hearing the Shure SM7B. And just to make sure, yep, sure enough. Okay. Shure SM7B coming in right now. It's um, We've got quite a bit of gain going here. I think we're at 65 dB of gain, so running it pretty hot here. We're not tickling the limiters a whole lot, but um, if I were to lat, well, there it did, just a little bit. So this is the Shure SM7B. Again, a dynamic broadcast microphone and um, pretty good in cases where you have a very bright voice. <laughs> so I think it works pretty decently for my voice. And also, I think it's one of my favorites to go to if somebody if, if somebody wants to record a podcast, for example, and they're in a room that is not acoustically good. This is actually not a bad choice in that circumstance as well. Okay, we're going to switch over now to the Lewitt LCT 440 Pure. One moment. Okay. Just put this up. Um, I'm going to mute for a second. I need to reposition the mic. I don't want to hurt your ears. Okay. We're back online. Okay, here we go. This is the Lewitt LCT 440 Pure. This is a brighter microphone to my ears than the Rode NT1. 
and um, I think it's not a bad sound as well, but maybe a little bit harsh on my voice, and so just wanted to run this by. So I'm, I'm curious from what you're hearing on your end, granted it's being encoded to a lossy format as it's streaming out, but I am curious how this is sounding on your end. Um, and if, if you were to advise me, because this is a question we get all the time, uh, how which, which microphone should I buy? Let's say I'm gonna do some voiceover. Of the microphones we've listened to so far, for my voice, which of these would you choose? I'm curious. For voiceover. And let's assume that I'm going to be in this space here, which is reasonably decent in terms of acoustics. Okay, so that's the Lewitt LCT 440 Pure. This is a little, I'm going to look at this really as a an ear training session for you guys. So you can hear one voice, multiple mics, and kind of evaluate, make some, make some judgment calls for you. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to pause for our mute this for a minute. I'm going to switch out into and we're going to get the um, tech zone audio hooked up. So give me just a moment here. And actually, while I'm doing that, I can turn the NT one on. I just didn't want to. Uh, you know, you got to turn off the phantom power, didn't want anything popping in your ears. And the LCT also comes with this shock mount. It's actually kind of an interesting and unique kind of different one. Here's what the microphone looks like, actually. Let's get you a little bit of a look at it. I believe it's either a German or Austrian country, company, I don't remember. Um, nice open basket there. Looks like it's got a couple layers on the windscreen and the way this works is you've got this retaining screw down here just pop that off get the microphone out and then you've got the bands here just sort of these uh, elastics here that isolate it so there's that one all right going over to the tech zone audio this is the vintage version, not the original version. The original version is um, a little bit on the brighter side. I don't have that one out today. That one's actually going to go to our friend Rob <laughs> as soon as I'm done with my voiceover video. He's already claimed dibs on that one, so that one goes to him. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and mute the NT1, and we'll be right back with the Stellar X2. Okay, we are here with the Stellar X2. I need to check my levels here and just see if we need any more gain. How's that looking there? Okay, so here we're on the Stellar X2 Vintage and uh, also a large diaphragm condenser microphone, also in the same price range, about $250 US. This one is, uh, the reason they call it Vintage is that they had, they sort of modeled it after the Neumann U47, I believe, in terms of its voicing. So again, just to review, someone just asked, uh, Scott just asked for prices. NT1A came, or sorry, what NT1 is about 270 US, Shure SM7B 400, TechZone Audio Stellar X2 Vintage is 250, and the Lewitt LCT Pure, or 440 Pure is, I believe, also in the same price range, about 270. Um, or maybe approaching $300. So they're all kind of, ex ex with the exception of the SM7B, they're all very closely priced. So this is the um, Stellar X2 Vintage. And I think it actually sounds uh, pretty decent on my voice based on what I can hear right now. And also the recordings, oh, and there's bumping it, and the recordings I've done in the past as well. So, all right. So there are some uh, samples. Which ones do you guys, uh, which ones, if you were making a decision, if you were the audio engineer, I'm your customer, I'm your client, you're consulting me, I want to do some voiceover work, I'm going to have a reasonably acoustically treated space to record in, something like this, uh, which of these would you recommend I go with based on what you're hearing and my voice? So let's go ahead and switch back to the NT1A again, just for, just for reference there. We'll mute this. 
Okay, back on the Rode NT1. This is the Rode NT1. Getting a little bit of whistly kind of, um, you know, kind of that distortion in the sibilance range that you sometimes get, a little bit. And then let's go ahead and switch to the Shure SM7B. Okay. Now we are on the Shure SM7B. That's the dynamic microphone. Should have a very different sound in terms of uh, the higher frequencies will be very, very different. Typically on dynamic microphones are not nearly as sensitive up there or they don't produce as much energy up there in terms of capturing that. So this is the Shure SM7B, muting that. Okay, now we're back to the Stellar X2 Vintage. Stellar X2 Vintage. I think that the Lewitt LCT440 Pure is a good microphone. I don't know that it's a great fit for my voice. I actually quite like it. It sounds fantastic on my wife's voice. Um, so I'm really happy with it from that standpoint. And this is a good example of how a good microphone may not be the right fit. Um, so there we go. Stellar X2 Vintage, and we'll come back to the Rode NT1. I hope this is helpful for you, getting a chance to kind of hear different microphones right next to each other on the same voice. NT1 is really bright, maybe a little too much, okay? SM7B does sound rather different from the others, no doubt. <laughs> Stellar's louder, okay, so that actually will influence how we hear things. So I'm gonna pull that back a little bit. Let me just come in here and pull the gain down a little bit. Okay, I'm going to mute the NT1. All right, we're back on the Stellar X2 Vintage. So I dropped it by about 4 dB in terms of gain. Hopefully that puts us closer into the same range here. So we did get a vote here, Stellar and NT1. Okay, interesting. Bangs Naughty Bits mentions that... Um, Dynamic mics usually sound compressed, and I think that's I think that's true. That's been my experience as well. A plus fifty for perfect voice, a perfect wife voice. You cannot beat that. <laughs> um, Daniel James says a Stellar X two Vintage might be my favorite for your voice. Okay, interesting. Good. Kevin, the basic filmmaker, says the Shure SM7B is his choice. I think its level is set a bit lower than the others in this test. Yes, it requires a massive amount of gain. So let's go ahead and switch back to that just out of curiosity. Okay, um, I have it down a little bit lower too, so I could see. <laughs> Let me hold it up some. So we're back on the Shure SM7B. And uh, yeah, it was a little bit lower there, I would say. And uh, Jeff also says the X2, so the Stellar here. Stellar is perfect for your voice, according to Alejandro. Can you do the Shure again with a little more gain? How's this, Kevin? Hopefully that uh, levels the field up a little bit. So I'm operating nice and close. It's at 65 dB of gain. We are tickling the limiter from time to time, just to give you a sense of where, and I'm probably peaking normally around minus 12. And then if I get a little louder, we engage the limiter, so. There's the Shure SM7B. And then Kevin submitted a comment and then retracted it, so I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, Henning says he prefers the vintage. Okay, good. Well, good, I hope that was uh, helpful for you. We're gonna go and mute this here one moment. And uh, it's looking by popular vote that the Vintage X2 is a good fit for my voice, so we're probably going to finish off the session here with this. <laughs> um, I will gain up just a touch, though. Okay, there we are on the Vintage X2 from TechZone Audio. So I'm going to go ahead and move these others out of the way just so I can breathe or feel a little freer here. All right, move this guy. Okay, we have a mess in here. <laughs> Let's go ahead and jump over to our questions and see what we got today. Um, that's going to be the overhead camera, and let's go to the actual questions. All right. 
Okay, uh, first up is a question from Aaron. Sometimes when I'm doing my audio normalization and compression, I realize later on during QA that bits of the audio have been distorted or over compressed, or the voice will just drop about 30 dB out of nowhere. Any suggestions on how to avoid this? Okay. Um, there's so many factors that I don't know because I just, I'm not there, but. Um, so there are a few steps in the post process that where things like this can happen. So if you're doing normalization, say for example, on just a dialogue track, then you drop it into a video timeline. Maybe you mix in some music that can throw things off. In, and you can also, you know, there can be settings in the, no, in the non-linear linear editor that can throw things off. Um, it can either boost them so that they end up distorted or it can drop them. So suddenly they're minus 30 to be out of nowhere, as you say. So there are just a lot of factors um, there. And I don't know if you're experiencing that as you drop them into a video editing app after you've done some of the audio processing. There are just a lot of things on the workflow we need to know. But if anyone else has run into these kind of things and you're, uh, you know, you, you come up with ways to prevent yourself from running into those issues, definitely share with Aaron here. Um, if Aaron, I have a proposal, if you have a YouTube account and you are willing to put together a video kind of demonstrating how this happens sometimes um, by walking through your workflow, that would be really cool. And I think we should be able to get you some good information here that'll help you avoid some of those issues. So it's a good question. It's a frustration that we all run into from time to time, but uh, hopefully we can help you get where you need to go. All right, next up, Nolan. I was curious if you knew anything about the Betso transceivers for timecode and if you used it. What's your preferred method for timecode on set personally? Uh, first of all, in regards to the Betso, I have not used them. Um, they look really cool. And the, the neat thing about the Betsos is that they transmit wirelessly. So they're, re I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're constantly rejamming the various timecode generators. So they do not drift from each other, which is awesome. So you don't have to rejam throughout the course of your shoot. Really cool feature. Um, whenever you introduce wireless, however, um, they, they'll they burn through batteries quicker. So I don't know uh, what the situation is with Betso and how well they do in terms of battery life, but that would be one thing I would look into a little bit more before investing in them. Um, but yet it seems like a great system. And um, for those I've talked to that use the Betso system, and I think some of our, some of our regulars here have used the Betso. So if you have, definitely let us know in the comments. Um, what your experience has been like with them. I generally uh, use the tentacle sync ease on set when I'm working with uh, a set where we need to use time code. Um, so it'll generally be narrative pieces or it, rarely it'll be um, like a corporate piece, but almost always it's a narrative piece when I'm working on that. And I'll use the tentacle sync ease. The nice thing about those is that I can keep an eye on, well, first of all, let me go back. I have a whole bunch of time code generators. I have a, like a good old, hardcore, old school, um, Mose gear, TIG Q28, I think it's called. I can't remember the exact model number, but that thing is just like built like a tank. It is one where you, you know, you don't have a menu. There's no screen. There are just a couple of dials that you can change. Um, they're recessed so they don't get bumped and moved and it runs on a double A battery. And I think it runs for about six hours, five or six hours. Um, and that was that was one of my very first. In fact, I think that was my very first time code generator, and it was fine. Um, but it you know it requires a few things. You need to rejam after <laughs> about four or five hours, and you need to change the battery after four or five hours. So that was one of those. Um, if you're going to work a really long production day, say a twelve hour day, you're probably changing batteries twice on that thing, and every time you pull the battery, you have to rejam. So um, that one was a little bit cumbersome to work with. It was a great for its time. Um, a great little time code generator. There's there's a beauty to th the simplicity of something like that, um, but I don't generally use it now. I also have some of the time code systems. I have the Wave Base Station plus um, the UltraSync ones, and I also have the backpacks for the GoPros, and I also have the, the uh, Blue, which is a Bluetooth transmitting one, and uh, that works with the with the Zoom F series recorders, incidentally, which is interesting. So it's transmitting and uh, maintaining sync via Bluetooth. That's a pretty cool system as well. The only problem I had with that system was especially like the Wave base station. If you're working from a cart, it's probably fine because that thing just burns through batteries. And essentially that's doing the same thing as a Betso where it's 
uh, constantly wirelessly transmitting and rejamming, so you never drift out of sync. Um, but I just wasn't as happy with the the um, you know the battery life. So if you're working from a cart, that's fine. I'm working from a cart very rarely, so um, so that that's where it just wasn't a great fit for me. <clears throat> Uh, tentacle Sinky, the nice thing I like about that is that um, you jam basically at the start of the day and you're good for the rest of the day. Um, I can re-jam them all from my um, mobile phone, so that's nice. And what you can actually do is use one of them as a master outside of your mixer and then feed that to the mixer. So for example, if I'm using my A88, um, I'll actually use an external... Um, Tentacle Sync E as a master clock and feed that into the 888. That way I can wirelessly rejam all of them without having to rejam the mixer as well. So that makes my workflow pretty easy. The battery life is phenomenal. It's like 35 hours, so I can easily make it through a, an entire day without having to um, rejam or change batteries or anything like that. So that's just the workflow that I use. Um, but again, I think the, the Betso and the timecode systems are also very nice, and their wireless features make things a lot easier, too. Um, I just wish that that wave base station was a lot more power efficient, but, you know, if you're constantly wirelessly transmitting, that's where things become challenging. So thanks for the question, Nolan. Let's uh, move on here. The Kevin, the basic filmmaker, asked, what is your name, what is your quest, and what is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? And I would say that somebody has been watching Monty Python recently, so good job. Good way to keep the spirits up during the pandemic. Number four, when live streaming with a Mix Pre 3 using the Shure SM7B and you need to turn up the volume, would you increase the gain or the fader? Let's, let's take that to the audience here. So everybody watching, what would you do? Would you go, uh, would you hit the fader and bump that up or would you bump the gain up? I'm curious. We'll come back to that. Go ahead and, and leave something in the chat there. Number five, do you care about or actually want the limiters kicking in on the meters somewhat or not? Okay, so this is a question in the context of, I, I went to Kevin's live stream yesterday and there was some discussion about this. People were saying, hey, it's not loud enough. And so <laughs> I assume you increased the gain and um, or, or pushed up the fader, one of the two, and then you were actually bumping up against the limiters. And it, it could be that the audio wasn't entirely... Um, calibrated between your camera and the mix pre I don't know but I was hearing a tiny bit of distortion and again it depends on how much you're hitting the limiters um, because li limiters are great even uh, analog limiters like in the mix pre series but if you're constantly up against them you're going to get this sort of odd uh, overdriven sound still you won't technically be clipping necessarily and actually you can I think you still can clip technically if you put something in loud enough but even if you're not technically clipping, it can have this really compressed sound to it. So, okay. So I was just looking over here at some of the responses. So we got bangs, naughty bits, fader, never screw with the gain while live. Okay. Trevor, bump up the gain first. LP seam, always the fader. Joseph Chua, fader for me. It turns out that the fader has... Um, is applying gain too. So you actually have some freedom to do it either way. Um, if you're in the situation where you are recording isolated channels, this is different than a live stream. Well, maybe, maybe it's different, maybe it's not, depending on if you're recording it as a podcast as well for post-processing and after. But um, generally you wouldn't wanna mess with uh, the gain. I would probably hit the fader first, um, but you you know, you have freedom. You can do it in any way you want. Um, but generally if you're, if you're doing it for a live stream, I'd hit the fader would be my, unless it's really, really low. If you're way under gained, then you probably have to go in and, and hit the gain. But in your case, Kevin, I would say you were not that far off. So I'm thinking the fader would probably have been appropriate in that case. So, um, so it, yeah, to just to circle back on your question about the limiters kicking in on the meters. Yeah, absolutely. It's fine to, to tickle them. Don't just don't be against them constantly. If, if, if it's kicking in the limiters and it's a little orange, um, line at the top of the meter on the mix pre, if you're hitting that on every single word, then yeah, you're you're overgained. You need to pull back some. Um, so there are some thoughts there. Let's see, Mark Randall, on the topic of limiters, I've noticed that the dB levels I'm getting in Audition don't match the same level of dB I'm sending in via the Mix Pre tone generator. 
Maybe it's a mono stereo thing again. Could be that. Also could be your output fader. Oh, no, no, you're, you're going in via USB. So that should be coming across the same. Interesting. Hadn't noticed that before. But it could, yes, it could be a stereo mono thing. All right, cool. Kevin, thanks for the question. All right, next up from Sang. Do you have an updated list of affordable lavalier mics? A few of the ones from your last comparison are not available, including the A-Lav. There are a few mics on Amazon with fairly high rating, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on those. I have, I have to confess, saying I have kind of dropped out of the inexpensive lavalier mic world. If you'd like to give me just a moment, I'll get this one. This is the lavalier Go hooked up, and let's see what we can get out of this. <clears throat> did it come with a clip? Oh, it did. <laughs> Good. I was like, wait a minute. Should at least come with an alligator clip, and indeed it did. So let's get that on first. We'll come back over here to the overhead cam. Get ourselves uh, cleared away here. Okay. So the way these work on the road mics is you've got this little hook here. Kind of squeeze it open, and you can put your windscreen back on. Okay. I'm going to mute the mic for just a minute here um, because I don't want to bump it and create all sorts of noise for you. So I'm going to switch back here. I'll be right back with you. Hang in there. the game. Okay, checking for levels here. Check, check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Oops, coming back here. Okay, we've got the wireless go here. I am not getting any levels here. Can you hear this? Oh, I know why. <laughs> Headphone preset. Stand by. Noisy. Guys, hearing a noise? Maybe I'm gained up too much. Let's check that out. Maybe pull that down just a little bit. Okay, that's uh, that's about where we're at here. And we do have some noise. There's a fan in this camera. Let me just turn that off. See if that makes a difference. I'm hearing a, a fair bit of noise. I don't know about you guys. What are you guys hearing over there? Lots of noise. All right, we're gonna to need to work on that one a little bit. <laughs> we'll hook it up to the wireless go and see what we get instead. But um, right out of the box, I'm hearing a fair bit of self noise. And that's not, uh, that's not stuff that's in the room here. We were working with these other mics earlier and not hearing a lot of that. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, mute this and we'll be right back. Okay, we are back on the Stellar X2 Vintage. Hmm, well that was instructive. Yep, noisy. Uh, Kevin the Basic Filmmaker, yuck. Noise. Gain too high, better now. Okay, noisy from Trevor. <laughs> Hmm, not too good, some noise. Okay, yeah, so we'll hook it up as it's uh, intended to be to the um, wireless go here and see if it's any better there. But uh, that was into the mix pre input number, uh, the auxiliary input there. So, okay. Saying, um, I have also reviewed the Deity, or yeah, Deity V, I think it's called the V.Lov, which is basically their update to the A.Lov. It's easier to use. 
um, it doesn't sound as good to my ears. But as when you're in those, you know, the inexpensive lavalier microphone realm, uh, lavalier microphone realm, you're going to experience that in a lot of cases. The trick with a lot of the cheaper ones, and part of the reason that I don't review them anymore, is that um, a lot of them are not shielded, so they don't necessarily work great with wireless systems, or you it just you're going to get un unpredictable results depending on which wireless system you're using. Uh, so that's a challenge with them as well. I would say. Um, if you're just reusing them into a recorder, then they're probably a, a little bit safer. And I also find that in the inexpensive lavalier microphones, the um, it just seems like the the there's a, a fair bit of copy to copy variance. So I might review one and say, "Wow, this one's amazing," and you might get one and go, eh, "It doesn't seem as amazing as the one you reviewed." <laughs> and I think that's legitimate variation from copy to copy. And that's really one of the big challenges with the less expensive gear, like the really, really like $20 or $12 lavalier microphones. Um, you can definitely run into some issues there. Okay, so thanks for that question saying. Let's go back here and see what else we've got. All right. Next up from Kent, I recently purchased the Rode Wireless Go. Hey, here's here's that theme again. First thing I tried to make work was to attach the transmitter to a boom pole with a Rode MTG2 with battery installed and the receiver plugged into output 3 or input 3 on the MixPre 62 using this connector and its female counterpart from boom to transmitter. Okay. All right. So, you put a Rode MTG2 on a pole with the battery installed and you plugged it into the mix pre 62. Okay. No go, not a input. Interesting. You put the transmitter to a boom pole with a road NTG. Okay, so it's the the signal chain is road NTG2, road wireless go transmitter, then a road wireless go receiver plugged into input 3 on the mix pre 62, if I understand correctly. Um, not an input. I checked the mic directly into the mix pre. That works fine. So I assume that in that case you're going with a Rode NTG2 with an XLR cable into one of the XLR inputs. So we know that the microphone works. That's good. You also did the Go system connects and works fine with its internal mic. Okay. So the problem you're getting is that you're using an XLR to 3.5 millimeter adapter and you're putting that into the Rode NTG2. So there are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Number one, um, I don't know, on the wireless go, it looks like it's re expecting a TRS input. So that's the first thing to con confirm that your adapter, XLR adapter is TRS on the 3.5 millimeter end. I assume it is. And then um, I believe that there's some impedance adapting that needs to take place there as well. So that's going to be a challenge. And then, of course, the biggest thing, I think, with the Rode NTG2 is that that microphone, despite the fact that it's a condenser microphone, is probably the most gain-hungry condenser microphone I have ever used. So um, that's a tough one. And I don't know for sure. It's interesting that you got absolutely nothing. I would have expected something, um, just something really low and laden with a lot of noise. <laughs> I can say this. I, unfortunately, I have never had good luck um, at adapting the X, uh, the Rode NTG2 to 3.5 millimeter. I've just never gotten good results with it. And I've, I've, some people said, hey, you have to, you have to get the right adapter cable. It has to have, has to do something with impedance. Um, but the reality is, is on that mic, it's just a really, really weak output signal. And just so it's, it's just not a great fit. And in fact, it, what's interesting is the output impedance of that microphone changes when you're running it on AA battery versus phantom powering it. The output impedance um, actually increases a bit. So there's some funny things about how that mic is designed. And I had originally, in my early days, <laughs> I had recommended that mic quite a bit. And I think it is a fine mic if you're going straight into an XLR input on a Mix Pre, for example. But if you're using a input that doesn't have a lot of gain, um, and especially if you're adapting it to unbalanced, I, I just don't know what to expect there. I can give it a try, but it, we just need to know a little bit more about that adapter. It should, you should get something, um, but I would never expect great results with that combination, unfortunately. You'd have to move up to a microphone that has a much stronger output signal, and ideally one that 
you wouldn't have to do a lot of adapting to, but um, I, I try to stay away from adapters if I can. But uh, in theory, it should work. <laughs> so Kent, thanks for the question there. Next up from Jim. I struggle with asymmetric waveforms. Okay, I watched your YouTube video on the topic and tried your phase rotation solution. It worked, but it takes some fiddling. After a little more research, I came across this post, and I'll put a link to this. This, this is a post from um, Paul Figiani, who has a website called Produce New Media, and he's also active on Twitter. If you've ever, if you've not heard of him, he's actually a, a very talented engineer. He does a lot of post mixing for podcasts. I think that's his main job, and. Uh, he is a, he's an engineer's engineer. He, he knows a lot of stuff. And in fact, he's the one that I learned about asymmetric waveforms for. So I'll put a link for that after the live stream down below. But in any case, um, he suggests that high-pass filtering can produce asymmetric waveforms. That is true. And it's not just high-pass filters, but they will typically do it to a fairly extreme degree. And let me, just for reference, so everyone knows what we're talking about here, Asymmetric waveforms are when your waveform, remember just if you're thinking about an audio waveform that kind of passes back and forth across the minus infinity line, an asymmetric waveform has more amplitude on one side of the minus infinity line versus the other side. So it sticks out more on one side. That in and of itself is not necessarily an issue, but it can become an issue if um, if you're needing to loudness normalize, because what happens in those cases is you're robbed of headroom. So that's the main idea here. Um, so anyway, back to Jim's question. So I turned off the 80 hertz high pass filter on my DBX286 or the 100 hertz filter on my Soundcraft SIG 12. And sure enough, the waveform returned to near normal. Upon trying to add high pass filtering from the Audition parametric EQ effects rack, the problem returned. Then I tried an FFT or fast Fourier transform high pass filter and it did not produce the asymmetric waveform. My question is, does the FFT filter provide the protection against low rumble that the parametric high pass filter does? And the answer is that yes, it should. And then going on, he's attached a couple screen captures of the two presets. The profile of the generic parametric high pass doesn't work for my voice as it produces an audible cut in the lower end of my voice. The FFT high pass produces no audible difference, but since my signal chain is fairly quiet, I can't tell if the inaudible low-end stuff is kept at bay. What do you think? So here are a few things to consider. First of all, yes, some um, audio processors, whether they're plugins or hardware, uh, whenever you're talking about high-pass filters, um, some of them operate on a... Um, some of them are linear phase, which means that what they do is they don't affect the overall phase of your audio. And that FFT high-pass filter that you're using I'm going to guess that's a linear phase high pass filter. So it's not messing up the symmetry of your waveforms. Whereas most other, um, a lot of high pass filters actually will. So for example, the, the EQ with a high pass filter that I typically use is Isotopes Nectar, and that does operate on a linear phase uh, principle. So it doesn't affect the phase. So it doesn't throw your, your waveforms out of symmetry. So that's just something you'll want to keep in mind when you're applying a high-pass filter. It can affect the symmetry of your waveforms. It doesn't necessarily affect the timbre or the sound overall, necessarily. Um, and I think basically Paul Figiani's, his perspective is that if you if you have a lot of asymmetry, it's generally worth, it's worth it to go ahead and, and do some phase rotation so you get it back to a symmetric point, um, just so you get that additional headroom back. Um, some people say that it does affect the timbre very, very slightly, but generally that the trade-off is worth it. I haven't ever, I've never noticed a difference in timbre uh, of the overall sound or the quality of the sound by applying a good phase rotator. And the one that I use is the one in Isotope RX. It's in the phase module, and it does adaptive, what it calls adaptive phase rotation. So anyway, there's some thoughts on that, Jim. Um, yes, you've definitely, this, this is a good sign that you're diving in and finding that things are different depending on what you use and how you apply them. Uh, you're definitely growing as an engineer, so good work. All right, next up from Clayton. Is ComTech the only way to get signal to directors wirelessly? And the answer is no, that is not the only way. Is there another cheaper option? Could you do it with the Rode Wireless Goes? Um, I, yeah, I've heard of people doing that, so you could do that. The problem with that is that You'll have to gain down your output from your mixer 
Um, so for example, I know you, you, you have a mixed pre, so you'll just have to use a fader and reduce the output level on the fader. And then on the receiver, which is what you'll, your director will have, um, they'll plug in headphones and they only get three settings for headphone volume. So <laughs> you'll want to definitely test that out before you do it, if you're going to do it that way. Could you do it with the new Deity device you were talking about with the other awesome soundies you got to chat, chat with earlier this week? Um, they were actually talking about the um, the XLR plug-on transmitter, I believe. If we're talking about Alan brought that up at one point in our conversation. And I don't think that would really work, I don't think. Well, you probably could make it work, but the new device that they're talking about uh, is the BP-TRX. And that's basically like a Swiss Army knife, and I think it's going to be a really cool product. I'm looking forward to testing that one out. But the BBTRX is essentially a transmitter, a receiver, a timecode generator, a Comtech, an IFB, all in one. So that will be able to do a lot. And I don't know what the pricing is yet on that. I don't know if they've announced the pricing. Maybe they have. Um, it's not going to be probably as cheap as a wireless Go because you're going to have to buy two two of the units. But um, Looks to me like a really cool kind of Swiss Army knife type of tool. And then let me know if anyone has any cheap alternate options for things other than Comtech. So yeah, Wireless Go is one thing you could do. People have used Sennheiser G3s for years on that. We have an older session where Greg Palmer came on and talked about specifically how he uses them for camera hops, actually. But you could also potentially use it as a, um, as a wireless feed for a director. So if you just do a Google for Curtis Judd Audio um wireless hop i think you'll find that particular session so all right next question here is from alonzo let me give you a little background here i'm going to switch over uh to another app here so there is this uh, i've had a couple of questions about this this week so there is this uh, tech review i think he's actually a camera reviewer over on youtube I think his name is Lee. He basically said the Zoom F6 audio recorder do not buy. No redundancy. Ne Zoom needs to fix this. So that's the context. Alonzo asks, um, he says that the SD card fails and the line output is noisy. So I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch the entire video, but I did get to skip ahead and look, listen to the part, part where he said the line output is noisy, and he was running it into a Sony a7 III. I don't have any idea what his settings were, but what I can say is that um, I, I did not experience that same thing with my Panasonic GH5, so it looks like it may be something specific to either his cable to his configuration settings or to his, or to that camera. And it could be that camera model in general or just his specific copy of that camera. I just don't know. There's just not enough information to know. In, re in regards to the SD card failing, um, the Zoom F6 only has a single SD card slot. That is a known, that's, a, that's just a known, um, it's a fact. <laughs> if he didn't know that and he bought it and um, now he's disappointed that it doesn't have more than one. Well, I think that's one thing you can you can you can figure that kind of stuff out before you buy stuff. Now, if he's kind of just doing a public service by telling people, "Hey, be careful! There's only one card slot. That's dangerous. If your card fails, you're out of luck." Um, that that's fine, and I think that's valid. Yes, that is one of the downsides of the Zoom F6. It only has a single card slot. That's all you get. Um, I have never had a card fail in the Zoom F6 yet. I don't use it a ton, but I have used it a fair bit. Haven't had any issues with SD cards. It also has a, uh, an SD card test facility within the menus that you can actually test the card ahead of time. Um, and yes, SD cards do fail. So that is a risk that you run with the Zoom F6. So that's a fair point. For him to say, do not buy, I think that's fair in the context of if, they're, if you're doing professional level work, and you cannot afford to lose a file, then yes, then you probably need to look at something that has some sort of redundancy of some sort. Um, two SD cards, the Mix Pre series does a backup after you've stopped the recording. Not quite the same as two, two cards, but um, it does get you two copies. And uh, in any case, um, but the, the, the output to his camera, that is a mystery to me still. I don't, I don't think we have enough information to really do that. He, 
he, when he wrote this comment in the video, Zoom reached out to me after the video aired. Their response was they are still working on the issue for the last four months and no solution yet. There will be one day down the road, but for now, as of April 25th, there is no solution at all. I don't know which issue he's talking about there. Is that the SD cards? Or is that the output being noisy with the Sony a7 III? Um, okay. And then in conclusion, as a solution, the unclippable feature can be solved in other recorders by dual recording, one at minus six or minus 12 and another, let's say minus 25 or less. So the solar shooter profile this F6 is aiming at is not so special after all until this problem is solved. I, uh, I, I think you might, no, I don't think you can do the dual channel record on the F6. In fact, let's just take a peek at that power it up right now. Um, but I think, here's the thing, it depends on how you're doing that. Um, dual channel recording is one way to solve that problem, but it's not the only way. 32-bit float is another way to solve that problem potentially. If you're, The problem is, is that if you're feeding audio to the output or from the output right here to your camera, if you're in 32-bit float mode, the problem is that the output can still clip. That is the reality of the analog realm. If you're doing 32-bit float in the recorder and you exceed 0 dB full scale, it will still record that information internally to the 32-bit float file. However, the line output can still clip. And so you can drop your fader, um, but you, you know, again, you're only working within a, a limited dynamic range on the analog part of the chain. So this is not just a problem that is unique. Let's get that in focus here. This is not a problem that is unique to the Zoom F6. So I don't feel like the criticism is necessarily, uh, it's not the same way I would look at it. Let's just say that. Um, here's the thing with the dual channel recording, basically what you do is you you say you have six inputs. If I set all of these to dual channel, I use up these three inputs. I can't connect additional microphones to these. I get three microphone inputs basically at that point. One of them gets recorded at whatever I have the gain trim set to. The other one gets recorded at a lower gain trim. If this one clips, I can always, in post, and I have to do this in post, I can get over to, I can cut in the lower level recorded audio clip <clears throat> and solve that problem. You can do the same thing with 32-bit float. Um, it just defers that fixing to post, just like the dual channel record does. So I, um, I disagree that this is uh, not a good fit for solo shooters. I think it is but the workflow is different, and that's the important thing. So if it clips on the camera because you're feeding audio to the camera, then you have to go back to the file, the 32-bit float file that's recorded by the Zoom F6. And if you do that, then you've solved that problem just like you would with dual channel recording. So um, I disagree with the, the um, conclusion. Um, I think there are still solutions, but there are some thoughts there that hopefully give a little more context to that discussion. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. That's it for the questions for this week. Okay. And we're we're almost uh, right on the dot here. <laughs> Curious. Uh, let's just take a quick peek at the comments here. I didn't get to share the comments today because I don't have Ecamm Live. So I'm going to have to come up with a solution for that. But I'm curious, how did the streaming from the A10 Mini Pro go? Uh, did it look any better, any worse? Um, I did notice that our stream our network and i've got i've got fiber to my house but i do notice that sometimes it's not 100 percent. we're at nine megabits per second right now but i did get a warning here in the youtube studio at one point um that it was oh actually it says it was too high <laughs> it was 12 megabits for a second there and it didn't like it um so i have it set you have a variety of different settings and i had it set to let's take a look at the switcher here Um, I had it set to the um, HyperDeck low setting, which is basically 12 megabits per second. So um, YouTube is complaining that I'm that I'm sending too much. <laughs> Sorry, YouTube. <laughs> so we'll probably go back down to the streaming high setting instead. All right. Daniel James says it looks fine or it uh, worked fine. Vincent Chen uh, says it looks fine. Is it possible to back up the memory stick in the USB on the Zoom F6 from Henning. 
no, it doesn't have that feature. So that's a mixed pre feature, but there is a USB C port here on, well, actually, let's switch over here. There's a USB C port on the F6. But you cannot plug in a thumb drive and use that as a backup. It just doesn't doesn't have that feature, unfortunately. Okay. DP re review was doing mic preamp comparisons with an A7 III and the Panasonic S1H and the Fujifilm Olymp and Olympus. The Sony seems to have a higher noise floor, and it didn't look like sample variants. There doesn't seem to be any follow-up on the last posting from DP Review. Okay, In the video that um, Alonzo is referring to here, I did hear that part where uh, Lee, I think is his name, the reviewer, um, he had a lot of self-noise. I mean, it was through the roof kind of self-noise, like um, So something was clearly wrong there. I did see the DP Review where they were looking at the different camera preamps, and I do remember them saying the Sony a7 III was a little bit noisier, but in the tests on the DP review uh, that I saw, it wasn't anything like what Lee was describing. So different, uh, different things. Okay, we're looking for, uh, oh, we had some super chats. Mr. Rob Christensen, thank you for that. Um, Alvaro Moreo, thank you for the super chat. Very nice there. Um, Vincent, thank you for the super chat as well. And then Ricky and LP Seam, thank you guys as well. I've got a lot of support here. I really, really appreciate it. All right. I think that's going to do it for us today. Thanks, everyone, for checking in for this week's Sound for Video session. I hope you're all getting um, an opportunity to, to make some good recordings. I know it's, it can be difficult to get outside right now. Some states are starting to open up. Um, we're being a little bit more cautious here. Well, I, our family is, I should say. Uh, Utah where I live is starting to open up a little bit more. Um, but my daytime, my day job employer has said, we're not going back to the office yet. We're going to wait and see what happens. So um, in any case, stay safe out there. Uh, use good judgment in terms of uh, exposing yourself. But hope you all stay safe and make some good recordings. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.